lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, in today's show, I'm sharing 10 little changes to your gardening practice that will make you much more productive. Productivity is a bit of an obsession for me. I'm always trying to maximize my efforts in the garden, streamline my time, and feel a sense of accomplishment after working outside. And every gardener is wired a little differently. Some people want to get up and garden first thing in the morning, while others wait to tackle their garden work late in the day. Still, others are weekend warriors. But whenever we talk about pursuing a hobby or a passion like gardening, it's important to remember that we're not doing it for a paycheck. We're not even doing it purely for happiness sake, because sometimes we can actually feel pretty miserable after being in the garden. So what makes us continue to garden and what makes certain that we don't give up on gardening? The answer is a universal truth for any hobby or activity. It's being able to make consistent progress and feeling that our time in the garden is meaningful. The productivity tips that I'm sharing with you today are designed to help you maximize your efforts and to squeeze every drop of productivity from your precious time in the garden. My hope is that by sharing these 10 little changes to your gardening practice, that you will reevaluate your approach and experience greater personal productivity as a result. Gardener productivity. That's the topic of today's show. And it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. But first, I want to make sure that I welcome new listeners to the show and just in general, say a word of thanks to you for spending some time listening to the show this week. There are so many awesome gardening resources out there, and I think podcasts are such a great way for gardeners to continue to grow and learn. That said, I am so honored that you're spending some time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast. And if you're looking for a deeper interaction on the subject of gardening, the best way to do that is for you to join the listener community. It's a free private Facebook group that I host for gardeners of all skill levels and locations. You can find it on Facebook by typing the name of our group into the search bar. So just search for Still Growing Podcast Group and the listener community will show up at the top of the search results in Facebook. You know, one way that you can make what you see on Facebook more customized to your interests is to join groups on Facebook that focus on topics you're interested in. So if you'd like to see more helpful posts about gardening, then by all means, join the listener community for the show, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And while you're at it, look for a few other gardening groups online as well. There are a ton of them in Facebook. I belong to many of them, and they are very, very helpful. Now, the Facebook group for this show, the Still Growing Podcast Group, happens to be the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any show giveaways from my guests. So if you ever hear about a giveaway, just know that you're going to need to join the group if you want to be eligible to win. Another great benefit of the group that I think is unique to our particular podcast group is the fact that you get to interact with guests of the show. Guests that have been on the show are always invited to participate, and the majority of them do. We've got Katie Dubow of the Garden Media Group, Joel Karsten, the author of Straw Bale Gardens, Joanne Vandenberg Ohms from John Sheeper's Kitchen Garden Seeds, Bryn Haas from Creative Living and Growing with Bryn Haas, Deborah Madison, the author of Vegetable Literacy, and Marta McDowell, the author of All the President's Gardens, just to name a few. And what I envisioned when I created the Facebook group is that by having guests who have been on the show join the group, it would give you a chance to continue the conversation after listening to the podcast, especially if you enjoyed their content. You have a way to reach out to them. And I absolutely love that part. 
The other thing I want to make sure to mention is that the content that I put into the group that I share with the listener community is something that I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. So everything that I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's easy to join and it's totally free. There's no cost to join. So the next time you're in Facebook, just look it up, the Still Growing Podcast Group, and then just request to join. I'd like to take a minute to welcome these new listeners to the Still Growing Podcast group, Paula Kelly, Dorothy Feltner, Mike Drake, Betty Bishop, Carrie Tillett, Kira Nichols, Deborah Johnson, Sarah Kim, Mandy Hitzman Rodriguez, Jamie Moore, Susan Ducey, Jana Lyon, Melissa Gibson, Horace Kephart, Angela Hanna, and Diana Robertson. Welcome, you guys. This week in the Facebook group, there were a lot of wonderful posts from listeners, including listener responses to this week's question of the week, which dovetailed so nicely with the topic of today's show. And it was, over time, how have you become a more efficient gardener? And Bree Arthur, the author of the book, The Foodscape Revolution, chimed in and said, direct sowing seed in mass to increase ground coverage and reduce weeding and watering needs, hands down the easiest way to get big impact. And then she shared a photo to prove her point. Laura Gonzalez said, with no summer rain in California, drip irrigation everywhere and mulch are key. And Sarah Kim also agreed. She said mulch as well. Danny Perkins said that for him, it was spending some time thinking about what he really wanted in a garden. He said he still spends 50 plus hours a week in the office, so there's not as much time to spend on plants that require so much attention. In fact, he replaced his veggie garden with tough perennials like echinacea, canna, and black-eyed Susan. And Danny recommends knowing what is good for your part of the country and plant natives. And then he also said mulch and controlling water use and weeds. That way you can spend more time enjoying your garden. Finally, Peggy Ann Montgomery, the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants, who has an amazing garden of her own, wrote this, and I thought it echoed Bree's sentiment of ground covers. Here's what she wrote. We have almost an acre heavily planted, and that's a lot for the two of us. She and her husband both garden on this property. Each year, we use more and more ground covers to cut down on weeding and mulching. In some places where plants can really run, we use mazes. We also use hostas, Solomon seal, Pacara, perennial geranium, Brunera, Phlox stolonifera, ferns, etc. Once they're established, they require very little care. They keep the weeds down and provide habitat for insects and ground feeding birds. And then listener Sarah Ladd shared pictures from her garden showing seedlings coming up, lilacs in bloom, and a crazy squirrel on one of her bird feeders. The squirrel's completely upside down. And I'm like, how did you capture this picture? And she's like, actually, it was my husband. And he caught it using his iPhone. So what would we do without those iPhones in the garden? It's a great photo. The squirrel is completely stretched out, his tail's straight up in the air. And he's doing what squirrels do, completely contorting themselves so that they can steal the bird seed. And then last but not least, Patricia Chandler Newport, who helps me out by serving on the Listener Advisory Board for Still Growing, she wrote a piece for her weekly community Facebook page that she shared in the group as well. And one of the things that I loved that she shared are her personal favorite tools to use in the garden. Patricia uses a Japanese hori knife for 90% of her weeding. She says it's a terrific all-purpose tool for weeding, planting, dividing, hoeing, and even cutting your sandwich. For larger areas, Patricia recommends the stirrup hoe, sometimes called the hula hoe. Patricia says this is great in a vegetable garden where you're cutting out weeds between the rows or in larger open spaces where you won't accidentally cut out the desirable plants in your zeal for weeding. Then for cracks in the sidewalk or between pavers, Patricia uses either a $1 serrated kitchen knife from the dollar store or a drywall keyhole saw, depending on how tight the crevice is. 
And then finally, Patricia ends her article by saying, never remove weeds by rototilling. You're likely chopping up roots, which makes more weeds and bringing dormant seeds to the surface so that they can sprout. She says, just don't do that. Okay. Anyway, lots of listeners appreciated this article. And Deb Gibson was asking for clarification on the knife that she uses. And Patricia clarified that the red-handled tool in the picture that she provided is her Japanese hori knife. She said the one that she uses is from a professional gardener's shop, and it's quite inexpensive. But she did caution that it's very sharp when they're new. And she said you can find them almost anywhere, even at Home Depot. She said they're often 30 to $40, although she got hers for 20 bucks. Anyway, I just love the listener community for the show. It's just full of people who share our passion for gardening. And it's great for me to be able to interact with you and see folks from all around who have a curiosity to learn more about gardening and so generously share their knowledge and information. So come on, hang out with us. Don't be shy. Even if you've been listening for a while and have yet to join the still growing listener community, it's really so super simple to be part of the group. I would love for you to join for free the next time you're on Facebook. Just type still growing podcast group into the search bar and then just request to join. I look forward to meeting you over in the group. Last week, I talked about the fact that I added a phone number, a hotline for the podcast, and it's 865-333-GROW. And if you don't have the letters on your keypad, it's 865-333-4769. And this week, I'm looking for listeners to call in with their ideas or suggestions regarding two different topic areas. The first is memorial gardens or memory gardens. These are gardens that you create to honor a loved one who's passed away. So if you have done that, if you've created a memory garden and could tell me about it, I'd love to hear what you did. And then the second reason to call the hotline would be to share your favorite garden recipe. These are the recipes that you dig out this time of year that you can't wait to use with your garden fresh produce. So those are the two things that I'm looking for on the hotline this week. Go ahead and give it a call. Leave your name, number, and the information that I'm looking for. And again, the number is 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group, and it's made up of a dozen different segments from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with, and that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. I also cover news and information on special topic areas like science and sustainability, And then there are other segments that are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the how-to DIY segment, the continuing ed segment, the plant spotlight, shopping, recipes, inspiration, and quotables. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay somewhat abreast of the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. All right. I always kick off the Garden News Roundup with the guest update. And this week, I found an article all about Mighty Axe Hops. Mighty Axe was featured back in episode 532 when I had the opportunity to speak with one of the co-founders, Eric Sanrud. And there was a lovely article about what Mighty Axe is up to in Agri-News. It's a nice little perspective piece on just how far they've come. And the article is called Hop to It, How Two Minnesotans Are Making an Impact on the Beer Scene. Anyway, it was fun to catch up with what they're up to in that article. And it's also a great reminder that if you're considering growing hops this year, that you go and check out that past episode. In sustainability this week, Gardenista shared this really wonderful article called 14 Ideas to Make a Small Garden Look Bigger. And it incorporated the use of this term enfilade. 
Now, I had not heard of this term before. It's an architectural term. And an enfilade is a suite of rooms that's formally aligned with one another. So in the definition that I read about it, it says that the doors entering each room are aligned with the doors of the connecting rooms along a single axis. So you see an entrance and then you look through the gate and then you see another gate and then you see another gate and so on. And so the fact that this path has a series, a gauntlet of entrances, if you will, with all these different gates that are stacked one after another helps to draw your eye through the path, through those gates, and it creates an illusion of even more space. There were a ton of great ideas in this article, and some of them are a little more sophisticated than your entry-level small garden tips kind of article. So if you're looking for something that's a little more involved, this is a great article to follow up on. In Continuing Ed this week, there was a great article called Seven Lessons Urban Gardeners Can Learn from Kate Gould's Gold-Winning City Living Chelsea Flower Show Garden. This garden was awarded gold and the Best Fresh Garden Award for providing genuinely accessible ways of how urban gardeners could green up their space. In any case, the writer of this piece called the designer up to try to find out what urban gardeners should learn from her design. And I loved what Kate had to say about using green in the garden. Here's what she said. I go to a lot of gardens where clients will say to me, my garden has no color. And I look at it and say, well, there's about 42,000 shades of green. Green is a color too. Green is great because it's textural and it offers contrast and you can get an awful lot of light and shade in a space with it. And the minute I read that quote, I was immediately transported back to a garden I had visited many years ago. And this was a garden to linger in. I had gone with a bunch of friends and we were standing in this garden just truly enjoying And after about 40 to 50 minutes, we were talking to the homeowner and she correctly pointed out that she had a mostly green garden and yet it felt as vibrant and colorful as any garden I had ever visited. And we were all so struck by that. Also in continuing ed this week, there is a new garden blog that I've stumbled on. It's called My Secret Garden, and you can find it at tanyasgarden.blogspot.com. This is a garden blog by Seattle area blogger Tatiana Searcy, and her pictures are awesome. So go ahead and check it out if you're looking for inspiration. She also has a fabulous Instagram page at tatiana.mysecretgarden. Gorgeous photographs here. In the how-to DIY segment, Pop Sugar in Australia featured this really fun article, and I put it in DIY because I think anyone can do it. But the title of it's called, You're Going to Be Obsessed with AstroTurf After You See This. So in this article, blogger Kristen Jackson of Hunter Interior turned her deck into a gorgeous maintenance-free lawn with AstroTurf. She was looking for something to cover the peeling paint that was on her deck. And instead of just laying down a rug, she turned to AstroTurf, the artificial grass, and the look was amazing. And she wrote that after using AstroTurf on a bocce court the year before, they fell in love with the quality and how well it had held up. And bonus, they decided that the softer AstroTurf was more friendly than splinters from their existing deck. And installation was very simple. She just used a pair of sharp scissors to cut the huge roll of AstroTurf to size. And then she covered the entire surface of her deck. Kristen keeps the surface clean by using a leaf blower. And if a spill occurs, she just rinses it off with water. And her little kid and her dog love to run around on the deck. You know, my next door neighbor had their backyard redone by HGTV in the early 2000s. And that's one of the things they did is under the swing set in their backyard, they installed AstroTurf. And it's been over 10 years, and the AstroTurf looks as lovely as it did the day it was installed. So that stuff can have real stain power. And I loved seeing this in the DIY segment. So if you're looking for something 
new and exciting to put on the floor of your deck, this could be the option you're looking for. Also in the how-to segment this week, House Beautiful out of England shared 17 of the simplest ways to spruce up your home. These are ideas from interior designers. And of course, there's a lot about flowers and utilizing flowers in your home for spring and summer. But I like to recommend articles like this to gardeners. And I recommend that you read the article with your garden in mind. So instead of seeing the suggestions purely as a means to spruce up your home, read the suggestion and then see if you can't reinterpret it as an idea to help spruce up your garden. In the Plant Spotlight segment, Mother Earth News had a great article on how to grow and enjoy bergamot. The article starts out, even if the plant had nothing but its beauty to recommend it, wild bergamot would still be worth recommending. It blooms from July through September. The flowers range from maroon to magenta to lilac, and they resemble a somewhat disheveled chrysanthemum atop a two-foot-high stalk. Don't forget this herb is a member of the mint family, so it's going to have those square stems and shallow root systems. It does prefer wet feet and partial shade. And then finally, they caution that growing bergamot from seed is a slow boat, so it's best to start with cuttings. Also in the plant spotlight is an article that came out at the end of May, and it's called Foxgloves, Rethinking a Fickle Flower. And what caught my attention was the line, there are ways to make foxgloves do what you want. And then it offers a step-by-step guide on how to transform foxgloves into a simple and show-stopping floral arrangement. It's a great article. In the news this week are a couple of different articles. One is about the work that talented florist Emily Thompson did to design gardens for a New York City townhouse in Brooklyn Heights. She created this beautiful rooftop garden with great plant combinations and then did this fantastic planter and fence installation for the back garden. The driveway has these little tiny pavers and then she sowed seed in between them. You have to see it to appreciate it, but it's just absolutely gorgeous. And it should be, uh, this particular townhouse is selling right now for $12.5 million. Also in the news this week was this super fun article from LifeScience.com. It was all about these crazy tree-climbing goats in southwestern Morocco. And it showed this image of a tree with 10 to 20 goats at the same time that have scampered up to the top of this tree that's as tall as 35 feet. And then the goats eat the leaves and the seeds on the tree, and then spit the seeds on the ground. So the reason the article caught my attention, of course, is the image of these goats way on top of the tree. It's absolutely freaky. And then the fact that they are spreading seeds by spitting. That was crazy. Finally, the spruce.com shared a great article about what to do and how to prevent black spot on roses. This is actually an article that came out in January of this year. But black spot is a fungal disease that affects roses. And like its name, it causes black spots on the leaves. And it eventually will cause the leaves to turn yellow and drop off. It's not very attractive. And it can also seriously weaken the rose plant. This article does a great job providing an overview of this problem and then offers a number of different options for treating it, including baking soda spray, insecticidal soaps with fungicide, neem oil, and sulfur. In the Dream Guest segment, there was an article that was posted in anothermag.com, and it's all about the garden of a fashion architect named Peter Marino. Business of Fashion named him one of the most important people shaping the global fashion industry. But he's also quite the gardener. In the article, He said, the garden is a culmination of 21 years of my Saturdays, a private passion, a healing, creative antidote to the stressful vicissitudes of modern life. And if you take a look at the pictures of his gardens, you can see that he curates plants according to height and texture. And he does this in huge masses that are absolutely gorgeous. And yet they're very soft and loose. And he purposefully lets them get overgrown so they don't look too serious. 
And he also does something else that I like. He says, I like to define spaces so each section has its own color, purple, pink, yellow, and so on, but with fragile green borders like the ragged edge on watercolor paper. Anyway, gorgeous photos and a beautiful garden that's evolved over time. I hope you get in the Facebook group so you can check out the images. In Science This Week, Journey North reported at the end of May that the migration for many hummingbirds is complete. And folks do an awesome job of sharing their observations and images of hummingbirds on the Journey North website. And listener Danny Perkins shared a video of hummers out and about in his garden. And I wrote him on the Facebook page and said, do you make your own syrup? And he said, I certainly do. One cup of sugar to four cups of water. He brings it to a boil and then he fills his feeder twice a week. So it was the end of May when he posted the video and he already had hummingbirds in his spring garden. Quartz.com reported this week that scientists are using gene editing to create the perfect tomato for your salad. Anyway, what was interesting to me is the three different types of genes that they had worked to isolate in order to create the perfect tomato. One gene is associated with plant joints. This gene was created by integrating wild tomatoes from the Galapagos, which stay on the vine longer because they have fewer joints with common commercial breeds. The second gene is linked to green leaves on the top of the fruit, which was associated with excessive branching and flowering. This one was interesting because they believe that it's the result of centuries of selective breeding, although they're not sure why breeders wanted this leaf cap developed. They suspect it's in order to hold heavier fruit. And then the last gene is also associated with flowering. So overall, fascinating work. In shopping this week, a couple of different deals that are on the Crate and Barrel website right now, at least they are as of today in the end of May. I headed over there originally because I was looking for a plastic pitcher that I could use outside and I wouldn't have to worry about the kids breaking it. And they have this really cool plastic pitcher that has four bubble tumblers inside. So when you buy the pitcher, you get these four different colored glasses. And it's just all nice in one piece. And they're all plastic. So you don't have to worry about anything breaking when you're outside. And then, of course, when I was looking in clearance, I stumbled on this thing called a Beck tiered server. It's this very beautiful server. It got great reviews and it used to be 60 bucks and it's on clearance right now for a little over 30. It's really, really pretty. And I was looking for some type of tray as well, something I could use to bring food outside since the tray I used last year cracked. And then if you just go into their search bar and you type in the word fish cup, you'll see in the clearance area that they have these really cute acrylic cups with fish on them that are on sale for $2.97. They're very sweet. And again, that would be great for outside dining with the kids. An inspiration this week is this gorgeous, luxuriant garden from Scotland. It was featured in Country Life, and I believe it's pronounced Warmestone. It's a beautiful, romantic garden. And one of the most fascinating things that I read about this garden is that many of the plants are grown through netting, which explains the almost impossible upright perfection of some of these towering blooms that are almost six feet high. Very inspiring. And then along the same lines was a garden that was featured in Gardenista, and it's Charlotte Molworth's Topiary Garden. And her topiaries include all kinds of animals, rabbits and all kinds of birds and foxes and pheasants. It is stunning. The quote for the week comes from Celia Layton Thaxter, born June 29th, 1835, died August 25th, 1894. Celia was an American writer of poetry and stories. Like the musician, the painter, the poet and the rest, The true lover of flowers is born, not made, and he is born to happiness in this veil of tears, to a certain amount of the purest joy that earth can give her children, joy that is tranquil, innocent, uplifting, unfailing, given a little patch of ground with time to take care of it, with tools to work it, 
and seeds to plant in it. He has all he needs. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. All right, now it's time to focus on the topic for today's show. In today's show, I'm sharing 10 little changes to your gardening practice that will make you much more productive. Increasing your productivity in the garden can seem like an impossible task, especially if you are new to the garden or if you're growing something for the first time or if you're inheriting an established garden that you know nothing about or if you're dealing with a garden that has grown larger over time. There are a number of scenarios that can make gardening extra challenging. In fact, every year, many folks simply throw in the trowel after feeling overwhelmed by the demands of caring for their garden. Now, in some cases, like when other aspects of life just demand too much of your time, it can feel like it's time to say goodbye to gardening. Oftentimes, though, that type of drastic decision is just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In fact, what makes many of us not as productive as we can be in the garden is not a lack of tools or know-how. It's simple problems like just being too tired to garden, feeling uncomfortable on the garden from things like heat or fighting mosquitoes, not to mention battling the endless distractions that can draw us away from actually getting anything done. There's a story I like to tell the kids whenever they help out in the garden. In Greek mythology, Sisyphus was the king of Ephra, known today as Corinth. The gods punished him for a number of things that he had done by forcing him to roll a huge boulder up a hill. This seems straightforward enough, but Zeus put a spell on the boulder, so before the boulder ever reached the top, it would roll away from King Sisyphus all the way to the bottom of the hill. And according to mythology, he's still doing it right now, pushing that boulder up the hill, because he's doomed to roll that rock for all eternity. In the same way, every gardener who is ready to call it quits, all the folks who think nothing will ever grow for them, they are just like Sisyphus. Poor Sisyphus only experiences constant futility and never-ending frustration. In fact, any time we experience pointless or repetitive activities that provide little progress, those types of activities are often referred to as Sisyphean. Now, the reason I share the story of Sisyphus with young gardeners is because I want to inspire them to make sure their time in the garden is meaningful and impactful, not just repetitive or laborious. In fact, the 10 little changes I'm talking about today, I've not only incorporated into my own garden practice, but I use them as guiding parameters for when I'm working with others in my garden. So before you start to go gangbusters in the garden this year, and especially if you already have been overdoing it, make sure you listen up and incorporate some of these gardening productivity habits into your garden practice. All right, let's get started. We're going to begin with this little game called Two Truths and a Lie. And so how it works is I will share two truths with you and then one lie. Here goes. Okay, statement one, there is no such thing as a maintenance-free garden. You have to decide, is that a truth or a lie? Statement two, there are ways to make gardening easier. Is that a truth or a lie? And then finally, statement three, people want a garden that requires them to do nothing. Now, is that last statement a truth or a lie? If you said that the first two statements were the truth, you are correct. And if you thought that the last statement was a lie, you are also correct. And a great way to illustrate how people actually enjoy things that require some effort is the story of cake mix. You know, Minnesota was home to Pillsbury and General Mills. We know a thing or two about cake mix. But when cake mix was first introduced back in the early 1900s, it was an absolute failure. And you'd think, why is this? Instead of having to go through all the steps of making a cake from scratch, 
all you had to do was take the cake mix and basically pour in some water, stir it together and put it in the oven and you would have a cake. Now, why wouldn't that be popular with people? Well, what they determined is that there just was not enough effort involved. People couldn't feel good about serving cake to guests that required no effort. Remember, this is back in the days when we would actually entertain people on a regular basis. Home cooking was a regular thing. Baking your own cake from scratch was a regular thing. They couldn't feel ownership of the cake. They couldn't feel like it mattered in the same way as a homemade cake. It was almost as if it was a store-bought cake. It didn't feel special, and they didn't feel proud of the cake. So what did the companies do? They took the milk out of the powder, they took the eggs out of the powder, and they incorporated the use of oil or butter. Now, all of a sudden, if you bought a cake mix, you had to add eggs, you had to add milk or water or oil. Now it felt like you were making your own cake. Now it was okay to make cake with a cake mix. And I love this story because of how it parallels with gardening. Because even though gardening is a lot of work, we take pride in it because of the work that we put into it. So keep that in the back of your mind as we roll through these 10 little changes to help boost your productivity in the garden. Change number one, let the walk around prioritize your work. You know, the best thing about productivity advice generally is that it doesn't involve any major overhauls of your life. And this is a great example. I always start my time in the garden with a walk around first. Now, that's not something crazy major that you would have to undertake in order to incorporate it into your gardening practice. But for me, it makes all the difference in terms of being able to prioritize my work. You know, my garden wraps around my property, so I have to walk all the way around the house in order to inspect all of my garden. But it's an important first step for me because if there's something that needs my immediate attention, I can become aware of it before I start working in a certain part of my garden. And I get that fuller perspective on just what's going on in every zone of my garden. And as I'm walking, I'm usually talking into my Apple Watch saying, remind me to prune this shrub, remind me to bring this container and, and put it in the front yard, that kind of thing. And the Apple Watch is great for something like that. And if you don't want to use technology, you can bring a little notepad with you as you're doing your walk around. And also as you're walking, you can be moving things. Listener Amy Steinhauser had just written that when she's walking around the yard, she's thinking, never go anywhere empty handed. Something must need transporting. And that's great advice. That's a great way to maximize your garden walk around. And the walk around truly helps me prioritize my work in the garden. Yes, there are times that I will go outside and my walk around will change the plans that I thought I had in place for the day. My plans are going to get hijacked. There's a leak in the irrigation system. There's a new pest or disease that needs to get addressed and needs my attention. But the key here is seeing the fuller picture of your garden before before you prioritize your work. Don't think of every garden task as being created equal because some tasks just are not as important as others or they just might take less time. So the walk around helps me prioritize my tasks. And if I have student gardeners in the garden that day, I just might start out with a few easy things, things that can be done quickly and efficiently just to get those things out of the way so that we have more free time and brain power to focus on what is more important. The other thing I'm doing when I'm doing my garden walk around is I'm seeing the bigger problems in my garden and I'm chopping that big problem into smaller chunks. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I was replacing the swings on the swing set with hammocks and swinging chairs. And that required some different bolts 
and other equipment in order to make everything fit. And so instead of spending an entire afternoon working on this project, we broke it into little pieces. And the first step was to measure the huge header board across so we knew how long the bolts would have to be. Another step involved just going and taking pictures of the areas that we were going to be working with so that when we went to Home Depot or Lowe's, we could show the people helping us what we were working with. And all those little steps along the way that happened because of the walk around, because I remembered as we were walking through the garden that that was the next step in that task, completing that big task became so much easier. We had broke that big task into smaller chunks. The other thing I think the garden walkthrough teaches you to do is to be ready for change. Just when you think you have your garden in a perfect situation, Mother Nature will show you otherwise. A storm can blow through and destroy your garden. There can be all kinds of things that will happen. So go into your walkthrough looking for those changes and teaching yourself to become more flexible. I see that flexibility in the garden as a skill that you can develop. It's one of the biggest lessons a gardener learns. And then whether you are putting your to-do list or your reminders in a technology like a phone or an Apple Watch, or whether you're writing it down, don't do it all in your head. You won't be able to keep it all in there. Leave the space in your head for thinking and ideas and use some system to record all of the to-dos, all of the things that you see as you're doing your garden walk around. And if you've never done it before, just give it a try. Try walking through your garden with a notebook and just jot down Anything that comes to your mind that needs attending in your garden, once you start, that momentum shifts from putting something off or thinking about the fact that you should start, and all of a sudden, you're becoming more action-oriented. You're starting to think in terms of tasks that need to be done, and you'll feel like you're able to corral all of those to-dos when you're writing them down. Now, if you're using your Apple Watch or you're using your phone, your smartphone, You can do things like set reminders, like remind me in five minutes that I need to go back and attend to the forsythia. Some reminders are even geolocated. So if you have that feature on your phone, you can say the next time I'm in the backyard, remind me to take some cuttings of this plant, that kind of thing. So the technology piece can be very handy if you like using that. Sometimes when I'm done with my walk around, I take a look at all of the things that I have to do. And when I really begin to look at that list, there are usually only one or two things that absolutely must get done in order to move the garden forward. There are always so many tasks and things to do But usually one or two things are significantly more important than the others on the list. So oftentimes, especially if I have help on that particular day, I decide to tackle my biggest items first before anything else. And the other thing that happens with that is that you kind of set the tone for the rest of the time that you're in the garden. You're accomplishing this huge task that maybe you were a little reluctant to get done. And when you do that, It seems like everything else moves forward with such incredible speed. There's that old saying, eat the frog. You do that one most difficult task first early in your time in the garden, and then the rest of your workload will just seem so easy after that. Another rule that I follow when I'm doing my garden walkthrough is to follow the two-minute rule. The two-minute rule is really simple. If I see a new task and I jot it down or I remind myself on the phone and it can be done in two minutes or less, then I put a little star by it because it can be done so quickly and so easily that I like to do a bunch of those all together. So little tasks like pruning an offending branch or moving a container Those types of things can all be done very quickly. They can be delegated or they can be done once you accomplish your more significant things first. And then, of course, along with this is the touch it once rule. It's the same rule that you apply to your mail where you really only want to touch it once. 
I'd like to try to do that in the garden. So instead of starting a task and then ending that or getting halfway through and getting distracted, I really try to finish tasks one at a time and just chug right through the list. The second little change is to calendarize your time in the garden. And here I would tell you to leverage the forecast and also incorporate your own personal commitments. Now, I like to use Google Calendar, and there are a number of ways that you can add your forecast, your city forecast, to your Google Calendar so that you know as you're looking at your calendar when the prime times to garden during the week are going to be. And if you're familiar with IFTTT, If This Then That, There's an app called Weather Underground that you can integrate with your Google Calendar and it will do all kinds of things and add it to your calendar automatically. It will add a rain warning to your calendar. It will put a weather report on your calendar every day at 6 a.m. That's amazingly helpful. It will record in the calendar if the temperature drops below zero. So if you're into recording the weather in your garden, you can totally take care of that automatically now with something like Weather Underground. I love this feature and it helps me be better prepared to handle any weather-related conflicts that might interfere with my ability to get in the garden. In terms of working with student gardeners, I like to keep certain days clear. That means that there are certain days of the week that I try to have the kids come over to help me in the garden, but I always say to them, if it's raining, don't bother coming over. But it at least gives me some idea that unless something unexpected comes up, Wednesdays will be my day in the garden, etc. Another thing experienced gardeners often do is they theme the days of the week. And this helps them to focus on major areas in the garden. So for instance, they'll prune on Mondays. They'll weed on Wednesdays. They'll plant or propagate on Tuesdays, that kind of thing. By batching work, you maximize your efficiency and effectiveness. And then finally, along with calendarizing, you can employ something that's called time blocking. So it's great to have that to-do list that you can create when you're doing your walkthrough in the garden, but don't fall into the trap that many people do, which is you end up with this huge to-do list, but you never accomplish it. So what you do here is you actually schedule time throughout the week to accomplish those tasks. And that concept is known as time blocking. It's so powerful. All you have to do is take your to-do list and then give each item a spot on your calendar, a time on your calendar. And it doesn't matter if you're doing it on your phone or you're doing it on a handwritten calendar. You just carve out the time and you chug through each item on your list. You know, statistically, only 41% of items on to-do lists are ever actually done. But efficient gardeners tend to put the things they want to accomplish on their calendar, and then they work and live from that calendar. And when I think about this, I always think of Martha Stewart's calendar at the front of her magazine. She'll say things on that calendar like, schedule the dog to get groomed today or divide the irises today. Now, I don't know whether or not she actually does those things, but it's a great example of matching the calendar to her to-do list for the month. Now, another way to think about time blocking is that, in a sense, it allows you to time travel. So if you think about your future self as someone who might get distracted or end up doing something else, even though you have great intentions, if you put the item on your calendar as an appointment, instead of seeing it as an item from your to-do, see it as an event, then you actually make that thing happen. The example I heard is that we are time inconsistent. An example of that is we buy veggies today because we think we're going to eat salad all week and then we end up throwing out rotting salad because we never got to it. So the key here is to schedule it on your calendar as an event instead of a to-do. And then finally, when you're looking at your calendar, make sure to do what works for you. I have a friend who gardens in the evening. Now that's crazy to me. She turns on her outside lights and she will be out there putting around at midnight. 
That's something I wouldn't do, but it works for her. She gets a lot done. She has a job during the day, and that's how she gets things done in her garden. So don't pay attention to what most people think is normal. Pick the hours that are most productive for you. Change number three is to leverage time intervals for work. So simply said, chop up your time and time yourself. When I'm in the garden, I set my Apple Watch to go off every 15 minutes, whether I'm working with other people or I'm working by myself. And when my timer goes off, I change activities unless I'm almost done and then I'll quickly wrap up. But in general, that timer forces me to work in bursts. And studies have shown that the most productive people work in bursts rather than diluting all of their efforts over the course of an entire day. And then when you throw in things like blocked scheduling as extra motivation, you suddenly have something more solid to rely on than just willpower alone. And the other nice thing about working in little bursts, in little timed bursts, is that you tend to focus on a single task at a time, which is so much more effective than trying to multitask And it also eliminates distractions. Another study I read said that average performers generally default to hours and half hour blocks on their calendar. But highly successful people know that there are 1,440 minutes in every single day. In fact, Olympic gymnast Shannon Miller once said, to this day, I keep a schedule that is almost minute by minute. If you master your minutes, you master your life. And another example that I found was about Adam Carolla when he was working on Loveline. He would complain to his producers because they wanted him to get there 15 minutes before the show started. And he said he would not do it. And his rationale was very simple. Every week, that extra 15 minutes added up to an extra show for free. And he wasn't going to do that. So good gardeners can get a lot done in just 15 minutes. Don't minimize that time. And when you think of your time in the garden in 15 minute increments, it just seems so much more manageable. And that subtle shift in terms of how we perceive our time makes us aware of everything we can accomplish in a shorter time window. You don't have to think that you need an entire hour to complete a given task or project. You just start on it and see how far you can get in 15 minutes. And if you need to devote another 15 minutes, then do so. But you might choose to break it up with something else and then come back to it. However you choose to approach it, those 15-minute intervals help us begin to appreciate how much we can accomplish in a quarter of the time. Another thing that started happening for me over the last couple of years as I employed this 15-minute timer rule in the garden is that I began to start these rituals that I could accomplish in the first 15 minutes And in the second 15 minutes, I was in the garden. And if you're wondering how you could create a similar routine, start to look at your lists on a weekly basis. And just by doing that, the repetitive tasks that you do every week will begin to pop out at you. And you can build those into the first 15 minutes or the second 15 minutes or the last 15 minutes of your time in the garden. And especially if you are overworked or tired or you're operating under, you know, pressure to get things done, those routine checklists will help keep you on track. This leads me into change number four, which is don't overdo it. Think of your energy for the garden as finite. You can't make more minutes in the day. You only have finite energy. But you can increase your attention, your focus, your decision making, and your overall productivity in the garden. Now, one thing you could try to do this week, if you've been overdoing it in your garden, is to reduce the time that you will spend in your garden by 25% every time you're out in the garden this week. And just see if by reducing the amount of time you're in the garden, that you don't get the same amount of work done. Because so much time is wasted, especially when you're getting fatigued. In general, I schedule myself to be in the garden for no more than two to three hours at a time, and ideally two hours. 
In fact, I generally do only up to two hours if I'm by myself, and then no more than three hours, even if I have student gardeners helping me. And I usually have four to five student gardeners at a time if I'm working with them in my garden. But I've learned that nobody is able to sustain the same level of productivity for more than two or three hours. It just can't happen. You get tired, you get hungry, you need a break. So again, this goes back to that short burst philosophy. Don't go into the garden for an eight hour marathon and then think that you can keep doing that all through the week and sustain your passion for gardening. There are are just not that many people that can do that. I think the important takeaway here is that you can spend less time in your garden and still accomplish the things that you want to get done by being more targeted and more aware of the time that you're spending in the garden. And believe it or not, there is no correlation between having the most beautiful garden and the number of hours you spend in your garden. In fact, some of the most beautiful gardens that I have visited belong to people who work a full-time demanding job, and yet they're able to attend to their gardens and their spare time on the weekends, and it still looks fabulous. They're not striving for perfection, but they're very smart about the time they spend in their garden. Two more points here in the don't overdo it change, and then we'll move on. The first is to schedule regular breaks during your time outside. I made a point of buying two dorm refrigerators a few summers ago so that I could stock it with various little drinks and waters for when it was time to take a break outside. Things that I would be excited to go and get for a little refreshment. That made a break more of a treat. And I even stash some ice cream sandwiches or drumsticks in the freezer compartment. And the kids don't know about that. They don't think I use it. So that's fantastic for me. I always feel like I'm getting away with murder when I do that. But just taking a little bit of a break helps. It helps me stay more productive because otherwise I get tired and I can lose focus. So I block that time off in my calendar. I do the block scheduling. I do the 15-minute alarms on my watch. I schedule a lot of the main things that I want to get done in my garden that week as events on my calendar. And I do take breaks. And the breaks also help keep my mind organized. So they're very important. And then the final point is, of course, that the whole time you're working in your garden, you want to be in tune with your body. This past week, I spent some time in my garden for the first time this year. In fact, it was just yesterday, May 25th, was my first time in the garden. And things are popping up all over. I could have been out there for a good eight hours. But of course, I just had rotator cuff surgery. And the garden is going to have to wait. And I timed myself. And after 30 minutes... I had to say goodbye and go in the house and give myself that rest. But the older I get, I find the more attuned to my body I strive to be, especially when I'm in the garden. And after having four kids who are now teenagers, I know that I can't exhaust myself in the garden and then waltz in the house and mother these four children if I'm exhausted. So I don't let that happen to myself. All right, change number five is to buddy up or outsource. I love this particular change because it's made such a difference for me in my garden. You know, gardening can be a very solitary activity if you want it to be, but I can't tell you the productive boost your garden can experience when you engage with other people. Years ago, I made a gardener friend who was about my level in terms of gardening skills and expertise, and we decided that we would spend one morning at my house working together and one morning at her house working together, and it was a huge boost to our productivity in the garden, and again, we weren't spending more than a couple of hours out there side by side, 
But with her helping me, it was the equivalent of being out there four hours. And with me helping her, it was the same. And the whole time we're gardening together, we're sharing our knowledge and we're sharing our skills and the little tips and tricks that we'd accumulated as we were learning to garden. And it was so helpful. We got so much done together. You know, back in episode 566, I was speaking with Jenny Prince all about how I use student gardeners in the garden. And if you haven't listened to that episode, you really should, because I share all of my tips for how to have kids help you successfully in the garden. And this whole buddy up concept is something that productivity experts talk about all of the time. If you have a way to tap into other people's time, that's the key. And the other thing to do is to consider outsourcing. I've heard it said you should focus on activities that are only within your Picasso zone. And Andrea Waltz, the co-author of the best-selling book, Go for No, puts it this way. Nothing will slow you down, take you off track, or keep you unproductive more than doing things which you both, one, do not like to do, and two, are not good at. Anything that falls in that category must be outsourced to someone else. The extent to which you continue on those types of tasks is what will hold you back from truly loving what you're doing and also being fulfilled. Now, if you're not quite sure what you want to do, or you don't have the budget just yet to outsource a project that you want to get accomplished in the garden, even just getting opinions from experts can be very valuable. Sometimes they can help you break these projects into stages, into affordable step-by-step options that you can complete over the span of a few years. And other times you might have someone come into your garden and give you ideas that you can totally do on your own. So it just depends. But I think it's helpful on a regular basis to have landscapers and other experts invited into your garden to leverage their expertise. And oftentimes they're willing to do this for free or for a nominal fee. But in essence, what you're trying to do here is to create a personal ecosystem that has a positive effect on your garden and your productivity in the garden. And when you're ready to move forward, hire someone, whether it's a landscape architect or a garden designer, to help you execute your vision in the most efficient manner possible. And don't forget, there are also many apps and websites that you can use to help you in creating your garden plan. But I think one of the best things about having other people help you in the garden is that you can reduce your decision fatigue. You know, decisions are costly and indecision is paralyzing. It wastes time. It zaps your mental energy. And a lot of times our decisions are piled up one after another on a runway of decisions and you can't move forward with the next decision until you finish with the one that's right in front of you. So by getting input from others, especially others that have expertise or your best interests in mind, you can get through those decision points more quickly, more efficiently, and thereby become more productive. Sometimes I like to tell my friends who have big things to accomplish in their garden this summer that it's more important to focus on what they're accomplishing than how they're accomplishing it. And by this, I mean that sometimes people are reticent to ask for help in the garden or to outsource something because in some way they feel that it kind of diminishes what they're doing. I suppose it's a variation on the cake mix story that I told at the beginning of the episode here. In any case, It's important not to lose sight of what you're trying to accomplish in your garden. And there's always plenty to do. So whether you outsource pieces of it or all of it, just know that you will be invested in your work. You will need to focus on it. And you still have to be motivated to make sure that the job is completed and completed according to your vision. Okay, change number six is to carve out a space for your gardening tools and resources. 
a few years ago, I reorganized my garage and I made a little space for myself for a makeshift potting bench. And that became very valuable to me. It, it gave me a home base, a place to kind of launch the operation from, my gardening operation. Just by having that devoted place to work, I started to see my productivity in the garden go way up. So if you don't have a potting shed or you don't have some type of dedicated space for your gardening, try to carve that out somewhere because you don't want to feel that you don't have a place to really make everything happen. And the other thing that happens when you create a place for gardening is that you consolidate the number of places you need to go to get things. And that alone makes you more productive. And then finally, having that space for all of your gardening tools and resources helps you put some processes in place. And if I had to pick one word that best describes how my student gardeners are able to get so much done, I would say it would be this process. In other words, systems. And a lot of those are based on the fact that the way my gardening space is set up in the garage is essentially the foundation for all the tasks that we regularly complete in the garden. And the best part about having a process is that you can outsource activities, especially if you know where everything is. And that's the perfect segue for change number seven, which is to work where you can, no matter the weather or the circumstance. Let me give you an example. So if it's raining or storming out, having my garden space in the garage means that on those kinds of days, I can do work in the garage, I can clean the garage, I can organize and sort all of my garden tools and the things I regularly use. And that means I'm more productive on the next sunny day when I can actually go out into the garden and work. And sometimes when the weather is crummy, you need to look for other options. You can create sheltered havens with huge umbrellas. You can work in your garage. You can do things in a shed or a covered porch or patio. The idea here is that you stop waiting for the perfect condition to launch a great project that you take the space that's available to you and you make things happen. So I've used indoor spaces to repair outdoor furniture, to sort and organize containers and pots, to cut strips of burlap, to create markers for plants. There's all kinds of activities that you can do in sheltered spaces. And that's why number seven is to work where you can. Little change number eight is to have a place to sit in every zone of your garden for dreaming and planning purposes. The concept here is that you want to be able to sit and be able to just plan and dream and use some structured thinking time constructively. Looking at your garden and triaging some of the design issues that you see right in front of you. Jotting down quick ideas and options for addressing plants that are crowded together or bare places in the garden. Thinking about small tasks, those two-minute tasks that could get done in the space that would make a huge difference. Identifying the bigger tasks and, of course, editing out the materials that are just not helping the design or are just not important anymore. Faded garden art or items that you put in your garden that are no longer life-giving to you. The idea here when you're sitting in these places is to get lost a little bit. Don't be available to other people. Just spend that time in the garden to think, to create, to plan, and to write without interruption. Pure focus time. And that's what leads to greater productivity with super awesome results. And this is why it's always good to have a garden journal because the journal is going to help you document all of this. And when it's time to review your garden, you have something that you can look through. And I can't tell you how much this has helped me, especially when it comes to addressing problem areas in the garden or making big plans for a garden. 
And if you've ever had the pleasure to look back and read through an old garden journal, you'll probably be very impressed with all of the things you were able to accomplish because you took the time to write all of these things down. You know, these thinking spots in the garden can be part of your morning routine or part of your weekly routine. And author Hal Elrod, the author of The Miracle Morning, says that while most people focus on doing more to achieve more, the miracle morning is about focus on becoming more so that you can start out doing less to achieve more. This is where things like planning and dreaming and imagining and creating are so important for productivity in the garden down the road. And if you're not a morning person, don't worry about it. There was a 2011 study that found that Late in the evening when we're tired is often a good time to tackle problems that require open-ended thinking. The brain benefits from having more room to work, more free space to think about solutions to our problems. I love to go sit out by the fire pit at dusk. My garden is all around the fire pit and I can just sit there and jot down some quick thoughts and feelings that I have about the garden. You know, another thing I know that people do, especially listeners of the show, is that they listen to gardening podcasts when they're in their garden. So whether you're working in the garden or whether you're using this thinking spot, this special place that you have to sit in your garden, you can continue to grow and learn just by listening to gardening podcasts or gardening audiobooks. And just that little activity, listening to Audio content in a subject area that we're passionate about can be one of the best ways to change your life, and it doesn't require any extra time. My last piece of advice in terms of having a spot to sit is to get a hammock. A few years ago, I transitioned our swing set into a hammock set, and I have three rope hammock chairs that have filled in the space where the teeter-totter and the swings used to go. And it is an absolute luxury to go and sit in the hammock chairs after I finished working in the garden or in the evening with the kids. Or if somebody's having a tough day, I'll say, let's go out to the hammock chairs and just swing together. And then we attach some ropes to the top of the header bar that goes over the top where the monkey bars are. So we don't even need our feet to push us anymore. We can just reach up and grab the rope and pull, and that allows us to swing, and we can keep our feet tucked in the hammock chair. But that aimless, relaxing time in the hammock is so great for productivity. It's a great place to just relax and take a break, listen to music, drink a glass of wine, do something that allows you to relax. And you just might be surprised by how much more you can get accomplished with a renewed and refreshed perspective. And that leads me to little change number nine, which is to change your perspective. Let me give you a few ideas about how you can change your perspective on your garden. You can walk through your garden in reverse. If you have a certain way that you always like to walk through your garden, I know I do. If you do, walk through your garden in reverse. You'll see it in a completely different way. You'll notice things that you don't notice when you always walk through your garden the same way. But walking through your garden in reverse is very, very helpful. And I've actually had the occasion where I'm walking through the garden in my regular way and I'll encounter somebody who's visiting my garden and they're walking through the wrong way and it kind of throws me for a minute. And I'll say, oh, oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Okay, so you just came from this way. Now let me walk you through the rest of the way. And I kind of actually have to rethink how I'm going to take them through the garden. So just something as simple as that, walking through the garden in reverse order can make a big difference in terms of how you see your garden. Here's another example. Walk the perimeter of your garden. For me, this means that I'm walking on the outside of my property all along the fence line, and I'm looking in at my garden as I walk the perimeter. This is always such a great reminder to me of all the wonderful things that I have blooming along the fence line. 
including asparagus that I would never even realize is happening if I never took the time to walk the perimeter of my garden. Walk your garden with visitors. Every time I walk the garden with a friend or someone who just wants to see the garden, I get a chance to see it from their perspective. And I always learn something. Another way to change your perspective is to walk your paths. Walk every path in your garden, the ones you travel all the time, the ones you've put in place that you hardly ever use. Are they serving a purpose for you? Are they helping you? Are they in the right space? Are they well-maintained? Or are people going to trip if they try to walk in that path? View your garden from inside the house, through the windows. View your garden from your neighbor's windows. I'll never forget the first time I was over at my brand new next door neighbor's house and I got a chance to see my water feature from their living room window. And I was so blown away because they actually have the best view of my water feature. And I thought I could just sit here for hours and look at my water feature. And sadly, I can't do that for my own house, but my neighbor gets to do it. But isn't that the way it goes sometimes? Anyway, it gave me a perspective on my water feature that I just had never had before. And it was thrilling. View your garden from the street, coming up from either side. View your garden from Google Earth. You know, a few episodes ago, I talked about how you can take a sketch of your garden by taking a picture of your garden property from Google Earth, and then using my sketch to transform it into a drawing of your garden. Look up. Notice the tree canopy that's over your garden. Look around. Look at the neighboring property and how it comes into contact with your garden. Notice the world outside your garden. And here's something fun to try. I have a dear friend who, whenever she would take me through her garden, she would have the tiniest little pruners in her hand. And I tell you what, if you want to change your perspective, go through your garden with just the tiniest little pruners. You can't do some of the big jobs that you might be tempted to do, but approach your garden with that super critical eye, with that tiny pruners in hand, and address things that probably wouldn't merit your attention if you're focused on the big and the brazen things that usually call for your attention. This is a time to go through your garden with a small pruners and take care of the things that just wouldn't warrant your attention otherwise. And then go through your garden with a loppers and take care of maybe the bigger items that you wouldn't normally get to because they're just too big. You can go through with other tools. Don't forget to go through with your camera take close-ups, take wide shots, go through with a screwdriver and take down garden art or birdhouses or tchotchke things in your garden that are not looking so great anymore or that are in disrepair that just need to come down. Go through your garden with a garbage bag, pick up debris, pick up things that need to be thrown away, strip out everything that does not help you move forward in the garden. Another thing to challenge yourself on is to go on a weed diet. Ignore your weeds and focus on other things in the garden that need your attention. You know, oftentimes I think weeds are just so distracting from all of the other wonderful things we could be doing in the garden at any given moment. Now, you may be wondering how it's even possible to go on a weed diet to take a break from weeding. But the truth is that many successful gardeners are able to do this. They're able to achieve many things in their garden because they don't constantly go out and weed. They take breaks from weeding. They focus on other things that need their attention. And then they go back to weeding. Weeding will always be there. You know, Frederick Douglass said, A man is worked on by what he works on. So we should steer clear of things that are quagmires or things that weigh us down, busy work or unsolvable problems. And oftentimes that's how I look at weeds. I see them as this never ending 
chore that has to be attended to. And I will never completely rid my garden of weeds in the same way that I will never completely be free of all of the laundry that I need to do in my house. And just when I think I have the laundry caught up, there'll be some catastrophe. And the next thing you know, I'll be doing loads and loads of laundry. And I look at weeding in the same way. So yes, I do weed. Yes, I obviously do laundry. But I see it a little bit differently than some of the other fun or more involved tasks that I do in the garden. You know, weeding is a notorious time killer. And I guess this is sort of the Pareto principle at work in my garden. So kind of the 80-20 rule. You know, for me, I know which activities are going to drive the greatest results in my garden. So I tend to focus on those and I ignore things like weeding. I don't spend the majority of my garden time out there weeding. And it took me a long time to learn this lesson. But if I spend all day in the garden weeding, and I don't spend any other time doing something creative or repairing things or adding something new and exciting to the garden, or I don't spend any time doing something fun or relaxing or something I can be proud of to show other people, then my garden is really not a reflection of who I am because I don't enjoy spending time just doing all this weeding. What I enjoy about being in my garden is pretty much everything else. And I think a lot of people are like this. The problem is that as gardeners, we often expect ourselves to have these perfect weed-free gardens. And that often runs counter to being productive in the garden. And it's worth noting how some of the most beautiful gardens that I've ever encountered approach weeding they leave it for later after more important or complex tasks are done in the garden and then they handle it in short bursts. They don't exhaust themselves and they recognize it for what it is, a never-ending chore. So in terms of changing your perspective, one of the things you can ask yourself is whether or not you're spending too long on certain tasks in the garden. Are there things you should outsource? Are there things that you should create a routine checklist for? Sometimes when we're so close to the garden, it can be difficult to see where the roadblocks and efficiencies are. So step back and change your perspective and see the garden more objectively. All right, we've made it to little change number 10, and that is to spend time with the young and the old in your garden, to know the ages of your different gardens, and spend more time with the new gardens and the tired or dying gardens. So think about your gardens in terms of how old they are new spaces or spaces that have just been cleared, that have just been birthed, require more of your attention than established functioning areas of your garden, those in the prime of their lives. And the same can be said for tired gardens, gardens that are maybe more than 10 years old, gardens that are just not working for you anymore. It's important to think about our gardens in terms of how old they are because when plants mature, we need to start thinking about editing, and that can sneak up on us. And seeing the garden with tired eyes can definitely inhibit our productivity. So in terms of prioritizing how you're going to spend time with your various gardens, prioritize the young gardens, those gardens that are three years or younger, or gardens that have just been cleared or created. Those gardens are clearly going to need a lot of design work, a lot of planning, a lot of energy initially to get them going. And then think about your older gardens and develop the skill of editing. I always tell my kids that they can easily edit the garden if they just stand back and look at it the way that they do the Christmas tree after we put the Christmas lights on. You know, if you stand back and squint, you can kind of see the patches on the tree where you maybe don't have enough lights. I kind of do the same thing in a mature garden. I'll stand back and look at it. You can easily identify areas where there's crowding, areas where there's not a lot of excitement, 
areas where things just aren't working anymore. Some plants can be overgrown. Some plants just have served their purpose and it's time to move on. Certain areas in your garden will change every few years as you replace other plants. And even though some plants need more time to achieve the desired design that you're looking for, you want to stay true to your own tastes and preferences in the garden. And those change over time as well. Sometimes editing your garden is just like when you edit your closet and you go through and the things that you thought you couldn't live without, you're all of a sudden ready to part with. The same thing can happen in the garden, especially in mature gardens. You know, oftentimes brand new gardeners will have such a difficult time getting rid of a plant that's not working for them and saying goodbye to plants that are just not working is a skill. So work on that. You know, every year things happen in the garden, whether they're planned or whether they're happy accidents. That's just part of gardening. But see if thinking about your garden in terms of maturity doesn't help you focus a little bit more on the activities that you need to do in that garden and how you can maximize your productivity to meet the needs of the young and the old gardens in your landscape. Well, that's it for the show today. The 10 little changes to your gardening practice that will make you much more productive. And whether you're brand new to gardening or a seasoned gardener, I hope these tips just might help you to get more done in less time and to help you stop feeling so overworked and overwhelmed in the garden. And here's my advice. Experiment with some of the little changes that I've outlined in today's show. Give them a try one by one. See if they don't help you become more productive in the garden. If something works, then make it part of your garden practice. And if it doesn't work, ignore it and try some of the other tips. Remember, your garden is unique. It's as unique as you are. So however you choose to achieve greater productivity, it should be tailored to you and your garden. I want to make sure that I thank my team at Podfly Productions for helping me produce this episode, Eric Begay, my editor, Ein Kadena, my copywriter, and my project manager is David Gregerson. I want to thank the listeners from the Still Growing Podcast group that make up the Listener Advisory Board, Beth Engel. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens and she gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants and she was also featured in episode 553 talking all about how you can incorporate native plants into your landscape and your 2017 garden. Just a reminder, I'll have all the information that I shared on the show today over at my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And then just click on podcast in the top menu and this episode will pop right up. And don't forget, you can contact the Still Growing Hotline if you'd like to share your memory garden or your favorite garden recipes with me, just call 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. I'd love to hear about the memorial garden that you created or your favorite garden recipe. I have to say, it's a kick for me to hear your voices for a change. I hope you're able to spend some productive time in your garden this week. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.